if we go back to, you know, like 1875, you roll into town with your wagon full of snake oil, your potential audience is basically like literally just whoever's in your line of sight. And eventually word of mouth, like literal word of mouth will spread that like, hey, don't trust that guy. And then you got to pack up your wagon. You got to actually physically move to the next uh, the next town over and hope that your reputation doesn't precede you. And the Internet just makes that like easier and it makes it faster. It enables it to be like a commodity. It enables it to be industrialized. We have industrialized grift in a way that uh, is is kind of unprecedented in in human history. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Beta Kid Podcast. Uh, as you can see, this one is a little bit different because you can see me. Um, we're back in our old Startwell studio experimenting with video and frankly, oh, it's horrifying. Uh, but there is a good reason. This week we are talking to Canadian YouTuber Dan Olson, known online as Folding Ideas. And we couldn't just do an audio podcast for a YouTuber of his stature. Audio listeners, I know you're not seeing this. I still love you. Now, you might not know Dan, but you have probably seen his three-hour video, Line Goes Up, attacking Web3 and NFTs, or his In Search of a Flat Earth video, where he systematically proves that we, in fact, do not live on a flat Earth. Beyond being a really smart and thoughtful guy, I wanted to speak with Dan because he's on a bit of a run with his content attacking internet grifts directly, dissecting them, understanding the cultural components and implications. It is very much my shit. Because he, like me, comes from a certain demographic of people unhappy with the current state of the internet because we remember what it was like before, back when grifts were charming, back when they were not scaled to such an extent as to be dehumanizing, horrifying, or... Um, metaversy. So without further ado, here is our video interview with Dan Olson, Folding Ideas. Dan, where I want to start is maybe with you telling our audience a little bit about your relationship to the internet, um, either as a human or as a content creator, and maybe both, because I think that's a great place to start to inform where we're going to go with this. So the first time I was ever on the internet was 1991. Uh, Edmonton, like I was living, I was living outside Edmonton and Edmonton used to have a, they, they used to run an ISP called Freenet that was like, it was just text-based, um, you know, <laughs> white text on blue background, dial up, 14.4. 14, 14.4, 14, yeah. 14.4 modem out, uh, out from the countryside and you know when uh when bullfrog software was uh announced like they were they were like we're releasing a trailer for dungeon keeper and i was super excited because i read about it in magazines and i wanted to see the video got that sweet so, gorod shading so uh you know saturday night we start the download because it's going to have all night and then it's church first thing sunday morning and that's good and we got to drive into town for that so it's like and it still was like two hours afterwards so it's like two in the afternoon the next day that it finally finished downloading this uh like seven meg uh, video file, which as you can imagine from, uh, from current standards of a video file, like there's, it's basically just, uh, just some vaguely moving blocks of, uh, blocks of color. Um, but yeah, so I've been kind of like the internet's been a part of my life essentially ever since it, it even just existed as a consumer, uh, uh, thing. So do you think our listeners would connect what you just described an experience that I also remember and, and I'm fond of to the internet today? Cause may, maybe that's the distinction because you have, you have been on the internet since there has been internet, but I, yeah. I, I feel, you know, just before we were recording, starting with this idea of we've also been around this thing called the internet long enough to trace its deltas and permutations. And I'm, I'm very interested in the conversations that you have now about the current state of the internet, possibly informed by your experience growing up with, you know, 
you should have just bought the PC Gamer magazine because then you could have got the Dungeon Keeper demo on the CD. But I, yeah. I totally hear what you're we're trying to pull off there. Yeah, so there definitely is sort of the element of like a lot of my current approach to the internet and talking about like internet culture is informed by the fact that I have watched it evolve so incrementally over the years and that if you're you know literate in the history of the internet and how people have interacted via it as a medium then it's kind of like oh nothing's really like new mm -hmm. you know like even what we're doing here like this is amazing kind of like software but at the end of the day uh this is just a conversation mediated by electrons flowing down some wires and th th that's not really this this is just a more advanced version of irc <laughs> okay you know it's it's a it's a chat room we've got video we've got real-time audio we've got all sorts of bells and whistles around the side in terms of like recording and uh uh you know conversions and and all of that stuff but it's just chatting over the internet right i agree with you and then i'm also horrified by the number of cameras that are pointed at me right now um <laughs> but I, i'm wondering let's i'll jump down a bit do you think that that's why Massively multiplayer RPGs are so instructive in articulating how the modern internet works because it seems like, um, you know, we solved uh, tribalism and min-maxing and uh, certain cultural norms that are ex existing in formats in the early days of uh, EverQuest or Ultima or things like that. Like, I, you know, we'll highlight some clips of content you've produced, but I, it almost seems like you're going like QED, World of Warcraft, therefore um, this is why Web3 is not going to work. Like we've, already, we've already done this before in another format. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I do think MMOs are an incredibly illustrative bit of technology in terms of it being a demonstration of the rubber meets the road reality of the sort of narrative of like, oh, what could we do with the internet? What is it capable of being? Uh, and then like, how does that actually mesh with the way that people do it? How does that actually mesh with people's day-to-day -day lives? And the big thing, like, you know, which I've been uh, delving into quite a lot over the last few uh, videos that I've made is that you can't live in the internet like it's it it feels insane that i need to say that but like i just saw it the other day that like there was a guardian article about like tuvalu is moving to the metaverse and it's like no they're not the and like it's this heartbreaking story where uh the representative tuvalu to uh fiji so like the pacific islands kind of have like a uh not odd but like unique sort of government structure because like they're so disper dispersed and, and population centers so Tuvalu has a representative to Fiji and then Fiji is sort of the inter anyway um Tuvalu is this tiny island nation that is at risk of just being completely wiped out by uh sea level change because the entire island like the I think the the midpoint is like a meter or two above sea level like the whole thing's very flat. And so if sea level rises, the island just ceases to exist. This is a tragedy. This is bad. And so there's this interview with the representative to Fiji where they're it, the, the whole thing is basically just a plea for some form of preservation that that here is this island nation that is going to overtly suffer from actions of industrialized nations hundreds thousands of miles away from them that they had no influence over and they're going to bear this just unbelievable brunt of it and they are making this plea that like remember us we need to preserve something mm -hmm. of us we are going to become an absolute diaspora because our home is going to stop existing and so we need other people to one let us in because we need to go somewhere uh and two there we need to remember that there was a place called tuvalu Okay, that so you... people lived and grew up on and and loved and left. 
And one of the ideas out of that is it's like, well, what if we create a digital copy of it? And this just ends up in the media as like, Tuvalu is moving to the metaverse. And it's like, no, they're not moving there. This is a you, requiem. Your for body society. won't fit inside the wires. Yeah. Okay. So you're triggering so many um, very specific cyberpunk dystopian novels in 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 connecting these stories. I want to go up to the the back to your journey in maybe engaging with this or articulating it. I really want to know, and I say this with love and affection for all the videos of yours. I'm going to reference here how you went from 20 minute video breakdowns of like bad PS2 games based upon an American tale or poor editing. And actually like a really good one-on-one -on, -one on like scene construction by showing how suicide squad failed to do that to multi-hour video essays, deconstructing internet griffs ranging from NFTs, metaverse, disinformation, flat earthers, like walk me through the evolution where you locked in on not necessarily poking at the corpse of like broken things and learning from it, but then kind of combating this, this narrative, whether it's a society moving to the metaverse as its final form of um, expression or traveling to a lake in your home province to demonstrate that the earth is not flat. So let's say, for the sake of argument, that an obscure flat earth video is still under your skin after several years. What do you do? Well, obviously, you throw a bunch of gear into the car, drive out to the mountains, set up on the side of the lake, and spend an hour aiming at a tree on the far shore, keeping in mind that if you want to persuade flat earthers, then you need to eliminate as much ambiguity as possible. So make sure to include an identifiable landmark in the shots to make it easy to pinpoint exactly where you're standing and where you're looking. Everything gets documented. Where was the camera sitting on the beach? Approximately how high above the surface? Even screen caps of where GPS says you're standing. Yeah, so in in my mind, the, uh, the chain was pretty simple. Um, the 2016 election uh, kind of, I, I don't want to say broke me, but like it was kind of a big turning point in my career and sort of this like reflection on like, you know, it's like, ah, he's just talking about movies like meaningful anymore um but like it was i mean like you know there was still a lot to a lot to talk about and it's not like truly frivolous and a lot of it was like you know i i was trying to like i was always trying to talk about narrative as like a social force and so you see a lot of that kind of getting tied up in in sort of the post 2016 stuff but then with the with like the rise of QAnon and the pandemic i've got lung problems so uh a a potentially fatal respiratory virus was uh particularly isolating for me mm. so it's like there's no more movies <laughs> and like the the movies that like all the movies that are coming out are getting delayed the industry of filmmaking was just at this absolute peak of like superhero saturation that was buckling under its own weight uh end game came out and i went and saw end game in the theaters and i made a vlog about about avengers end game and after i uploaded it i just kind of sat there and was like i feel done <laughs> like i I know that the next few years are still going to be dominated by superhero stuff. I can see the slate. Like it's just, it's, it's all superheroes for the rest of forever. But Endgame was like almost too successful in what it was trying to do. And I was just like the Marvel stuff, like it's over. Like they, they, they managed to somehow sort of wrap up this big giant thing that they're doing. I have no emotional need to engage with any of this anymore mm. i'm just i'm done and then when suddenly movie theaters are closed it's like all right maybe i am actually like literally done i mean that's not to say that like i don't care about movies anymore like i went and saw the batman like four times <laughs> <laughs> uh you know i went and saw dune several times um uh bell and like uh, a bunch of other things like there's still great films coming out but there's just like th th 2020 wound up being this time where like i was afloat i was feeling very isolated not a unique experience um and i was watching 
anti-vax rhetoric run wild i was watching QAnon grow in force there was like the looming 2020 election at the end of the year and um just kind of the idea of of dredging up you know the snyder cut one more time just kind of felt like why well to go back to what you said though like you know the internet is not a place where you can live but it, you're also talking about a time where because of the isolation driven by covid most of your touch points for everyone were online and it's not like those touch points were bastions of safety or fun or hope or anything else like that right so i i just there you know it seems like in some of your early content there was a um you felt charmed by the inherent sadness or poor quality of what you were investigating and then there's a switch to where either because of technology the the scale of the problem was more was more tangible more real more direct more harmful and then uh instead of walking it around and commentating on it you were directly addressing it or look maybe even looking to counter it am i am i looking too far into that no no i mean i think that's an interesting kind of reflection on uh reflection on my work i don't think that that's uh necessarily wrong i can see where you're coming from with that yeah i mean i think just something kind of like changed um gradually over time i mean and but then uh, in search of a flat earth is just very obviously like from a production standpoint such a like sharp demarcation point demarcation point that it, that it does almost feel like this like y you know hard pivot but like you know going back like just sort of sprinkled through uh through the past stuff like you do have um you know i made a video about uh now defunct video platform vidme and like their rhetoric of how they were appealing to content creators mm. um and you know really doing this like really very ur tech like buddy buddy like hey we're all in this together like you and me we're all friends look we've got a fun little avatar and you know like basically just redredging up reddit's whole shtick from 2010 and it's like, yeah, okay, we got the whole snoo. We've, we've been through the whole snoo thing. Like, we know, we know where this goes. Like, you're not, you're not my pal. And especially if you're trying to draw in like content creators, and and this was like what 2016, 2017, uh, YouTube had already evolved into like very much like a professional um, uh, platform. Like, not necessarily like as a default. Like the what YouTuber means is is very very broad. But like the idea of like, oh, you do this as a job, like that you can build a channel that is a multi-million dollar business that like as a like at 2016 2017 like that was already no longer sort of this like weird outlier thing it's like oh yeah no this is a viable channel of distribution and so you know vid me and various like youtube competitors coming in and trying to play the you know trying to play the we're just buds routine it's like no i know that that's not true because i know what my relationship with youtube is like and i know that we are business partners like we have common uh we have common interests but those interests are not 100 percent aligned and our relationship must needs be just definitionally somewhat adversarial because there are going to be a lot of situations where those aren't in alignment with each other and we're probably going to like butt heads over you know uh who gets what and so i so i i have been always kind of concerned about the business behind the curtain and like laying that bare and being willing to talk to my audience about like hey these are the incentives that apply to like all youtube channels that apply to me um and like that's why i can like speak about them like very kind of confidently is that it's like look i can see these influences i can see these incentives like weighing on me this is how my channel needs to be like structured in order to do things these are like the things that i'm leaving behind in order to do it like i don't do uh, I don't do sponsorships. I don't do influencer marketing. And like, oh boy, the 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 dollars that I've left on the table by not doing that is like 
pretty substantial, but that's kind of a like. <sighs> Do you feel like you kind of have the I privilege to to cho- to not have to choose that? Because you know, to, to I absolutely of- have the privilege of like not taking that. Like, just my my life circumstances, my willing to li- my willingness to live like a hermit. Um, you know, enable me to, to not, to kind of like brush off that pressure. Um, it helped that like I was doing industry work, um, well, kind of like the channel was like being built and, and growing. So like there was a very long time where I was very honest with, uh, with my audience about the fact that it's like the channel didn't make money. Like it was making, you know, maybe a couple hundred dollars a year for like years that I was doing this. And so in that kind of a situation, I was sitting there looking at it and it's like, you know, a mobile game comes along. And it's like, hey, we'll give you like 200 bucks if you uh, if if you plug our stuff. And I'm like sitting there looking at my, uh, you know, looking at my balance sheet. And it's like, that's not going to make it. Mm. That's not going to make a difference. I would rather not have that connection and be able to like have the freedom to maybe like trash talk you in the future if i feel like it uh versus like i don't know a third of my rent like whatever so what what is the what does the business of folding ideas look like now as it stands um we've peaked uh <laughs> and so it's been nice <laughs> um i i don't really uh i don't really know that's in flux at the moment so line goes up was a big was a big hit and just by virtue of being like about the subject of cryptocurrency it was subject to very high very aggressive ad targeting For online content creators, the unavoidable subject of 2021 has been NFTs, from incredibly cringeworthy ape profile pics to incomprehensibly tasteless tributes to deceased celebrities to six-figure sales of the original copy of a meme. It is the thing that is currently dominating the collective brain space of digital artists and sucking up all the oxygen in the room. And I do want to talk about that. I want to talk about my opinions on NFTs and digital ownership and scarcity and all the myriad dimensions of the issue, but I don't just want to talk about NFTs. I can't just talk about NFTs because ultimately they are just a symbol of so much more and it is that more that is ultimately important. So let me tell you a story. Uh, Everybody knew and I talked about this in the video even that like all of the crypto outlets were doing like just these absurd advertising pushes. Um, You know the fortune favors the brave ad campaign uh the well simple uh, larry david the wealth set like just all of that um and they, they were doing it very very aggressively and very very targeted and so the way that online advertising works is that the more specifically you want to try to target uh target an ad the more you pay and they were so aggressively targeting that the CPM rates online goes up was just like eye watering. It was, it was like 2010 all over again, Mm. you know, pivot to video was back baby. And, And so, so like financially it was just like an immensely, uh, rewarding thing. I don't think I'll ever see success like that again, but it has afforded, uh, the channel like kind of as a business like a little bit of slack to you know try to try to up our game and like reach out to other people because like it's for years and years and years it's it's been just me like graphics (laughs) graphics sound video like i'm the camera operator i'm the editor i'm the gaffer i'm the grip i'm the i'm the everything and like that's why as the quality went up the release get you know the Mm. release weight rate went down is that it was just taking so long um so i'm trying to uh uh kind of you know it's like take advantage of this uh this like once in a lifetime opportunity and maybe uh maybe get a couple other people on board and uh and um 
maybe speed this up maybe just improve uh improve the quality maybe just like accelerate enjoy death. the moment while it lasts <laughs> you know enjoy the it's like in just like there we go there's the peak yeah. i can see it behind me line goes up and now my you know it's like i'll never i'll never taste those sweet heights ever again but uh okay uh well, but yeah you know enjoy it well uh uh while i'm in the shadow do you want to, you know, it's weird because we've been kind of talking around some of your videos and I want to get to them specifically, not only for people who are unfamiliar for you to kind of walk through um, some of those conversations, uh, because I often find myself when I'm watching your videos making notes so that if I were to ever run into you, I'd be like, yes, I agree with you. And these three other considerations that you probably cut in your script. But I, I'm, yeah. I'm just wondering if you, you know, to what you're speaking to um, over this process following the the web three NFT video that kind of blew up on the internet, your videos are getting uh, longer and I would say like greater in scope and the release cadence seems uh, longer. Ponderous. <laughs> I, w I wouldn't say so <laughs> for, because you know um, you did one on um, and, and I think it was this video. It wasn't line goes up, but it was the video that you did on tech bro, multi-level marketing, scams oh, yeah, yeah where you yeah the mickelson twins yes and... do, you, do you want to describe this process because like i think it's just important for our listeners to know and i guess people watching i'm not used to that but i guess people will watch this video hi you're watching us talk about a conversation um you participated in that multi-level marketing scam for like a full month to truly understand it yeah. to critique it from the inside this wasn't a a, a, a drive-by tweet thread you literally went into hell and came back with the receipts. So I'm commissioning this book from the underground writers. And then in parallel with that, I am going to try to also write a book at the same pace. And the topic that I've selected for myself at the moment is a skeptic's guide to hypnosis. So the book is going to be 25,000 words. I'm giving myself a month to do it. They assume a thousand words per day. So that's 25 writing days plus five days for like editing and administrative slop and then delivery to the client. So I want to try to keep pace with that. So I'm going to try to do a thousand words per day for 25 days on the subject of hypnosis yeah so that one that one was complicated because okay so a couple of things were going on there one is that the like speaking of the peak uh the response to line goes up was like so unexpected from from my standpoint that uh that producing that video was a lot of work it was a lot of effort i was really kind of like burnt out my plan was release it at the end of january kind of like take february off just to sort of you know get caught up on video games get caught up on movies you know yeah. leave the house elden ring's just um, sitting right there elden ring was sitting right there like that was you know that was a big one that that i hadn't uh hadn't touched at all like i think yeah like the 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 day that i launched it i went out picked up elden ring came home spent three days putting together uh putting together some jigsaw puzzles that i'd gotten for christmas <laughs> and then and like just like left my phone off but like the response was so um kind of like unexpected and overwhelming in a way like there was just like it was like hey we want you to be on a podcast it's like okay cool hey we want you to be on this other podcast hey we want to interview you for like we're doing an article hey we're you, you know we're we're working on like there was like two documentaries that reached out to me that like wound up like falling through just i don't know they fell apart as uh as their like funding was no longer interested because like it's like ah you're talking about a market that's on decline the decline whatever nfts are dead who cares now but like but the this sort of like constant stream of like other media reaching out to me to just like talk uh wound up taking up like a really surprising amount of time so rather than like taking february off i spent february like mm -hmm. doing podcasts and talking to journalists and then i spent march doing podcasts and talking to journalists and then i spent april avoiding talking to journalists and not responding to emails to come on podcasts and it was just like okay this is like just 
releasing line goes up wound up basically taking an additional three months mm -hmm. and so that's why like the next video like and that just burnt me out and so that's why the next video wound up being like so much later in the year did you also pull um, your contact information off the internet for a little bit because i think uh, when we got through to you we were like because i i uh our strategy between katie uh my po podcast producer and i was like we're just gonna creep creep his twitter and his twitch because we can't find a, uh, a valid email address for him and then a few weeks ago we were checking again and all of a sudden there was contact email. I was like, God damn, did we miss this? No, this wasn't here I, before. He put this back no, up. No, that was, that was new. That was actually <laughs> like very new because my, uh, uh, I've, I've hired a part-time assistant who was like, you need to set up a proper email mm. so that you stop getting like overwhelmed by this. And cause it was just that problem of like the contact email was just like my email uh, which meant that it was also like the sign up for a bunch of things and there was a whole bunch of personal stuff in there. So she's like, uh, she's like, well, just give me access to the email. I'm like, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that like, I don't know if I want somebody to have access. There's like password recovery stuff. Steam in there account. And, like Steam accounts. It's like, I just don't, I just don't feel comfortable. Like, you know, I trust you, but I don't feel comfortable. Like I'm too vulnerable. I don't trust people. Uh, and she's like, well then set up, set up an actual like business account. I'm like, yeah, but that sounds like work. It's like, yeah, it is work. It's your job. <laughs> well, okay. And then, yes. Um, but so, yeah, we just got that set up uh, recently. I, I did kind of like basically go into hiding. I, you know, for a long time, my Twitter bio was like, I don't read my DMs anymore. Mm -hmm. There's too many. But, the, but back to the subject of uh, the book thing. Yeah, I kind of, so I, I, I was working through all of the stuff and initially I was just interested in it because I had seen these really annoying ads over and over again. And of course, once you like engage with an annoying hustle culture ad that primes you to receive a lot more hustle culture ads. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of wanted to make a video like just on those as a whole, but this one in particular, like the, the publishing thing was particularly fascinating to me because my my assist my my friend crystal who i've hired as an assistant she sent me the thing and she's like i have a i have a game for you i want you to guess what the scam is <laughs> because because she had seen like the first three seconds and it was like she had heard the word like publishing industry and she's like pause i'm gonna send this to Dan. dan we're gonna play a game we're both gonna see if we can guess the end from the beginning and so we sat there like watching it together uh putting our predictions into uh uh into chat and we wound up being like about like 75 percent correct so i'm like oh man this is kind of like a fun thing to just sort of engage in because it's a really like dumb scheme uh to just be it's like yeah you can make it on audible by publishing audiobooks that you don't write and it's like there were so many layers to it that i was just like that's a lot of steps it's a very and intricate dumb scheme it's a very intricate dumb scheme and so there's so many steps that it's kind of like inherently comical that it's like the answer of how did these guys make money is just straightforward like they you buy their seminar it's it's like you buy their seminar that tells you like this this intricate 12 steps scheme to put out garbage that no one's ever going to like read or listen to uh, and then you put out your own seminar and then you graduate to a higher plane that's when and, you level up exactly yeah exactly uh but so as i was like dealing with it i started i was like should I just take the seminar? Like, should I give them the $2,000? Like, should I do the deep dive thing where it's like you actually give them the $2,000 so that you have access to all of their internal training stuff and you get to do the one-on-one -on -one calls and you get to see just like just how sad and pathetic it is inside. And I was like, ah, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. But there's this other element to it that stood out to me of like hiring the ghostwriter where I'm like, that's kind of a scam in and of itself, isn't it? Because the thing that popped out to me is that in an older version of the uh, of their seminar, um, of their free seminar, was the instruct like was explicit instructions to like don't go to like professional ghostwriters like 
if somebody's going to charge you like five thousand dollars to ghost write a book which is not an extreme price by like any means if someone's going to charge you like five thousand dollars to write the book like don't you want to go to like these guys who are going to charge you like 400 bucks i'm like that's uh that's that's a number for sure there's a parallel scam here worked, that we're running into <laughs> yeah you know as somebody who has worked freelance as somebody who has worked online as somebody who has has touched the gig economy what's the math on that as as somebody who's a in effect professional writer what's the what's the what are the what's what do the numbers look like and it turns out the numbers are bad <laughs> the numbers are like awful and 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 gross and like soul crushing and uh, so it was that element of like putting myself into that situation to sort of have uh you know have the product out the other uh, out the other side so like the internet likes sensational uh it, it it likes things that are that are like a little bit ridiculous they like when uh when when content creators like subject themselves to horrid conditions for the amusement of others um that's not new by uh by you know any stress that's that's as old as time um but so i was like you know it's like you know what like i could i could deal with like a, a month of just kind of this like punishing writing schedule and then i would have the like book as uh uh, like whatever I wrote out the other side, I would have that as kind of a kind of a thing that like you know that'd be good to uh, that'd be a good kind of like bonus to like give to patrons and and whatnot that in that enjoy that. But it um, almost broke you as a human. Like I don't think you know again. Oh, it was grueling. YouTubers putting themselves through strenuous conditions for for the for the views is a song as old as time. But then so is usually the performative impacts of that. There's a certain point in that video, I'm incredibly concerned for your mental health and well-being. Not only because of, I think, the, it appears like just the, the, the burdensome requirements of you trying to get through this process, but even though you're going through this scam as a thought experiment to understand the other scam, you're still committed to producing something approximating a quality work. And the fact that yeah, you're failing to do that the... is like breaking you. <laughs> One of the elements that I don't know if it really came through in the final product of that video is sort of a despair over like what this machine does to um, the people who get inside of it. Because the thing is, is that th this whole ghostwriting scam is that they are actively preying on well-meaning people. Like they're they're targeting, like their their ads are targeting you know college students high school students single moms uh stay at home moms you know but very specifically people who want to write mm -hmm. uh they are actively trying to pull in people who like have a passion for writing and are it's like hey do you want to be a professional writer are you having trouble like figuring out what to write about well hey if you become a ghost writer you can be a professional writer you can hone your craft you can like enjoy the the thrill of creation without needing to like you know worry about like coming up with with your own idea because somebody else brings you like hey write a book about this and you've kind of got that like assignment structure that lets you just like really engage with the the craft of authorship and then you get inside the machine and it is in every other way designed to crush the love of writing out of you by turning the act of writing into this oppressive like millstone that they hang mm -hmm. around your neck where you have all of this math that's just aggressively against you where you need to be writing a thousand words an hour in order for the numbers to make like any sense as terms as, as in terms of like outcome uh, income and it's just like oh this is this is bad this is like really bad that if you're going into this as somebody who wants to write as somebody who like has has bought the rhetoric of like this is your opportunity to to be a professional writer 
and your brain is still in the mode of like trying to create good stuff like if you're still in a mode of trying to produce quality of mm. trying to write things that somebody would actually want to read you are going to have that just ground out of you because you can't you can't afford you you don't have the the luxury of time to like actually hone anything and produce good stuff you have to work fast you have to work sloppy you have to be just like shallow and meaningless and you have to regurgitate like the first things that come up on on a google search because you do not have the time to do anything else now this is now i'm leaning in this is where i want it this is the conversation i want to have with you because what we're talking about is the dehumanization being a feature and not a bug. And I think what resonated with me, of course, I wanted, I, I saw the podcast you were on when uh, uh, Line Goes Up came out, but it, it was specifically this video because I, I, I caught the trend of he's attacking griffs and he's attacking griffs that are either distributed or forwarded or generated through internet culture whereby the impact is always one of human beings are lesser for participating through this. Because yeah. the process that you're describing is very similar to the play to win scenarios for NFT yeah. games or cryptocurrency and speculative digital assets in an entirety where um, the more, the more human being a fulsome, you know, um, body and wrapped in soul construction <laughs> engages with these digital systems the more it it breaks them and the more like those that ignore those things succeed and, I, and i'm wondering if like are you aware going in that that's what you are seemingly most upset about or is that what you keep uncovering as you um map these internet graphs like is there a commonality there in your search or in discovery uh, I think it's just like, I mean, there's an element of like, that's just sort of what appeals to me. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's bad. Like a appeal is sort of a, a, a weird word in that regard, because we're used to appeal as like a positive thing. Like, oh, this is a thing that I like. This is what I like love. But like, it's the thing that, it, that draws me to these is that like element of dehumanization, the human cost, um, spoiler like what we're working on right now is the whole meme stock thing and like it's it, it's it's kind of the same story that that it's this whole conspiratorial system that draws people in and just like crushes them um it convinces them to go to a real casino and and gamble with real money uh but the game that they're playing is not one that actually exists they're they're placing bets with real cards at a table where the dealer isn't it isn't actually on the same wavelength as them they're betting on green and the dealer's like sir this is blackjack mm -hmm. And they're double it, and they're just saying it's like I'm all on green, all on green. And it's like no, this is this is blackjack. We will take your money, but you're going to lose because green doesn't exist. Um, but then behind them is a whole chorus of like influencers and grifters who who are screaming, "Keep betting on green. Eventually, you'll win." And it's like, no, like you're not even gambling at that point because like it, it's literally impossible for you to win because your your base assumptions about the game that you're playing are faulty. Uh, and and that's that same kind of like dehumanization, uh, dehumanization element that sort of the Internet has enabled a speed of communication uh, and has enabled people to connect with each other at a rate and an intensity that aggravates all sorts of human like every human interaction is just like dialed up to 11 by it you know the the fact that like weirdos and the conspiratorially minded and people who are willing to shake them down for all of their money have been like they've been able to find each other in some degree 
um, ever since agriculture was invented. Yep. Uh, and the internet just makes that like easier and it makes it faster and it makes the, makes it a commodity. the accumulation of people. Yeah. And, and it does it, it enables it to be like a commodity. It enables it to be industrialized. Uh, and, and that's, I think the, the common thread between like, sort of like what's, what's driving me creatively these, mm. uh, these days is, um, there's, there's no shortage of that. Uh, that we have we have industrialized grift in a way that uh, that is is kind of unprecedented in in human history just due to the the access to eyeballs the access to like the, the population the, uh, the grift distribution the the grift grift distribution of yeah because like if if we go back to you know like 1875 you roll into town with your wagon full of snake oil uh your potential audience is basically like literally just whoever's in your line of sight and eventually word of mouth like literal word of mouth will spread that like hey don't trust that guy and then you gotta pack up your wagon and you gotta you gotta actually physically move to the next uh the next town over and hope that your reputation doesn't precede you um and to a point where that seems quaint right yeah, yeah, that it's like, oh, you can only grift people who are literally in earshot of you. And now it's like, oh, earshot is global. What's the one thing every founder needs, but is still shockingly hard to find? A good lawyer. People look no further than the sponsor of this week's podcast, Good Lawyer. Now, Good Lawyer has quickly become the trusted legal partner for scale ups across the country. With fixed fee legal projects and their new fractional general counsel solution, Good Lawyer offers something that law firms simply can't, top legal talent and upfront prices. Now, I'm no lawyer, as you may know, but I can speak from personal experience with Good Lawyer. Betakid was having some trouble getting contracts done in a timely manner. We got connected with Good Lawyer and they got the work done in one quarter of the time at one quarter of the price. And as you know, startups, Cost and speed are everything. With a growing team of over 130 experienced lawyers, Good Lawyer is your one-stop shop for all your corporate, commercial, and IP legal needs. If you're starting or scaling your business, don't waste any more time searching for a reliable legal partner. Visit goodlawyer.ca today. Tell them that Beta Kit sent you. I've, I've, I've been starting to pull together, possibly inspired by you or just informed by thinking through some of the things that you're thinking about. I have this running list of human behaviors that are totally acceptable in a limited case, but are fundamentally unacceptable in any way on the internet. And I think yeah. a good counterexample of this is bullying, right? I, you and I are of a certain age. There were probably some experiences with, with, uh, with bullies who maybe didn't want to play dungeon keeper that, um, in the moment were isolated uh, instances of terror, but over the spectrum of your life necessarily weren't uh, effectively harmless, all things considered. There is no way that bullying in any form of the scale of the internet becomes something other than uh, a crushing weight <laughs> on sure. young people's I mean, society. I, I had a little bit of a, I, I had a particularly acutely bad experience that led to me needing to like change schools. Mm. So... <laughs> Like, uh, it, it, it did become, it did evolve into like a, a years long terror campaign against like me specifically, uh, that kind of, that kind of sucked. But like, yeah, you know, in, in other situations, like in high school, you know, my, my high school experience was pretty typical that it's like, yeah, you have some conflicts with, uh, with other kids your age who are going through like their own crap and, uh. And, you know, maybe you get a little bit older and you have a bit of empathy as you look back and realize like, oh, you know what, that like you you saw that kid's dad in the parking lot once and he was blotto at 3.30 in the afternoon and got in the car to drive anyway. And you're like, ah, his, th things were not going well over there. That's pretty dark. Those after school right, movies maybe. were made for a reason, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, they were made for a re Ah, OK, I can I can maybe I don't. I, I don't enjoy the fact that he like slammed me into my locker, but I maybe understand now as an adult that, uh, that, that he had, you know, some things going on. Mm -hmm. 
but yeah, with, with the internet, like it's, it's very, very difficult for it to not turn into just this incomprehensible force multiplier on any of that in particular, because, you know, so many people are willing to use it as just a vessel into which they can pour any grievances that they already have a big long running thing that I see like in <laughs> uh so I did a I did a video trilogy on 50 shades of gray yeah <laughs> and one of the things that really stood out to me as I was researching 50 shades of gray was the way in which people used this not particularly good novel trilogy as just like permission for just horrendous misogyny that it's like oh here is a woman who has made something cringe that that deserves criticism like it's not it's it's not very good and there's some like truly questionable things about it and about the way that she promotes it so we can just call her whatever we want and it's like no, 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 you can't. No, you can't. And one of the one of the groups that I'm like monitoring right now, so like Bed Bath and Beyond is uh, going bankrupt. I don't, I don't know what your release schedule is. They might be. They might no longer exist at all. Given the, the scale of the internet, out. it's almost guaranteed that it, were we to release this immediately after the conversation, Bed Bath and Beyond is probably gone. <laughs> probably got you know they're they're not long uh they're not long for this world but because the current ceo is a woman mm. you know there's like the the rhetoric about uh about her is just like it's it's just all the grievances that these men have against like every woman in their life you know you've got you've got incels you've got extremely divorced men just saying like vile stuff because they're like oh I didn't get the result that I wanted. Therefore, I now have permission to just like heap misogynistic abuse on this woman. Uh, and and that kind of applies at different scales uh, and and across different instincts all across the Internet. You know, somebody puts out a kind of cringe tweet uh, and it just becomes permission to dump like all all your <laughs> You are you you have I have elected for you to become a sin eater. I will now pour into you all of my rage, all of my grievance, all of my problems and and just like heap this abuse on you with no regard for you as uh, with you as a person. And we see it happen over and over and over again. And just like, yeah, the speed of communication allows it to be uh, uh, the, the speed and breadth of communication allows it to be a very potent force multiplier on human interaction yeah and you, you don't have to even be there to push them into the locker anymore right you can just you can just hit send from anywhere from, yeah from the toilet I'm, I'm wondering um you talked about the appeal of kind of doing these autopsies of uh grift autopsies is it is some of that appeal trying to find ways to contextualize like meme stocks or a group of individuals on the internet doing something for the lulls but like actually shifting economic markets like is it is it is it trying to get around that because you described to me before man setting up a business email address sounds like work and as a as a blogger turned um podcaster turned you know reporter running my own media business that speaks to like a certain part of my core that never wants to respond to emails but you also then you know research for months to produce a four hour video walking through everything related to uh blockchain technologies cryptocurrencies web3 nft games you will travel to a lake to uh take measurements to uh prove that the world is not flat you you will finish writing the book i'm wondering like how you get energized to go through a much more arduous process to do this. Is it, is it coming back and sharing with people or is it actually the exploration itself? That's a, that's a difficult question because that kind of goes to like, what is the measure of a man? <laughs> hey, we're um, at the 50 minute mark of this podcast. If we weren't there yet, 
I'd be doing it wrong, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so like it's it's that's a deep psychological uh, question where it's like I don't know if I'll ever truly have the answer to like what do I get out of this emotionally? You know, like uh, obviously uh, it's my job, so uh, there's a there's a financial incentive in there to like keep making stuff, or you run out of money and that has we live in a society where running out of money is very bad mm -hmm. you don't you don't want to do that uh bad things happen to you if you if if you run out of money so okay so i need to keep paying my bills so that's one incentive to other people like really enjoy uh engaging with that content and they express like they express extremes of human emotion in response to it. Like, it's like, oh, I can't believe that you did that. Oh, that's really interesting. Oh, and and you get to like feed off of that emotional, uh, uh, off of that emotional energy. You get that. You get that serotonin hit from the from the attention. Um, there's the like creative indulgence of just like doing it. Mm. Like, oh, going out to Minnewonka and doing that experiment with the uh with the with the jib and demonstrating the curve like that was a thing that I had wanted an excuse to do for just like years um because I knew that it was possible I knew that the the math worked out and I knew that if you did it right it would it would look amazing mm. and being able to create something beautiful is you know uh very profoundly rewarding um you know just just emotionally uh emotionally so it's this whole soup of you know different incentives like you know it's like i want to pay my bills i want to create things that inspire people i want to create art i want to make things that like move people that look good that are aesthetically satisfying that make me uh feel like i'm pushing myself creatively that i'm that i'm bringing into the world the type of stuff that i want to see exist the kind of videos that like i would like to watch the kind of you know footage that i would want to see uh you know if, if somebody else had done the minnewonka experiment i i would have just been in love with that i would have been all over it I would have felt immediately jealous of like, oh, I could have, I could have done that. I should have done that. I should have jumped on that first. And so, yeah, like it's a, it's a complicated web of, uh, a web of incentives and, and desires and like, what, what is, what is the measure of a man? What, what makes, uh, what makes someone a person and like, what makes an artist an artist? Smash that subscribe button. <laughs> it's all the same question. Okay. Can we talk a little bit about, cause you know, um, there is a, the Canadian connection here. Um, yeah. I, again, I'm not sure when I knew, I, I guess it was probably that in search of a flat earth video, which was not one of the first ones, um, that I had watched of yours, mostly because I've got a lot of degenerate friends that play too much. Wow. And were obviously sending me to other content of yours. Um, and possibly cause I was not looking to engage with the, thought process of that like i deal i deal with the hustle bros every day in work the the flat mm -hmm. out earthers are you know do, like do i want to um it's like that scene from like mind hunter when he's like coming home it's like i don't want to i don't want to have to solve a murder in my house after yeah. after doing yeah. that every day but um you know i think that video was the first time i was like god damn it, this guy's based in alberta this is so cool that's just down highway one <laughs> Is it, uh, Highway 17 uh, West, I think I would eventually get there. Um, but I'm wondering, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about Bill C-11 and what it means to be a Canadian creator right now? Because when this, regardless when this is released, I think probably while we're sitting here right now, um, our, our federal government is, has been pushing through several bills that are going to radically change the relationship Canadians have with the internet. Um, I think mostly in ways that this federal government doesn't intend. Uh, which is something that we've been covering in great detail uh, on this podcast with um, Senator Colin Deacon, uh, Rain Maida, for God's sakes. But you are, uh, yeah, I listened to that. I listened to that interview with Rain. Oh, what were, um, what were your thoughts there? As as because we, I, I, let me set this up, and then I'll ask you again. Because the reason why we brought Rain Maida on that podcast 
was I felt that most of the conversation coming from the creator class was coming from a group of creators that had only learned not to bite the digital platforms that feed them. Yeah. And uh, I wanted as a as a child of the of the 80s who grew up with a CanCon that shaped some of my cultural understanding uh, and creativity. I wanted to bring a generation of creator who had gone through some of these battles and uh, articulate the positives and the negatives. But you are um, the ideal representative, I think, in some ways. Um, I don't know how how many TikTok dances you do that that uh, that like Google and YouTube would use and say. Oh my God! If if C11 goes through, then we'll be forced to never show anyone folding idea videos again. Because if people were to know he were Canadian, or we were to sh tell Canadians that he was also Canadian, that would ruin our algorithm, and we don't want to do that. Am, am I? Do you have a another perspective on this? Because again, I'm coming from someone who doesn't like being bullied by big tech, who fundamentally believes that it's the responsibility of our democracy to make these decisions. And then is also watching our federal government like truly fail to legislate this stuff. But I, yeah. I would be remiss to not ask you about this because it's going to affect you probably more directly than it will me. Bringing this to to the Internet, uh, Bill C-11 is like really difficult because it's been um, it's a mess. It is a legislative mess and the two sources of information on it or like the two like biggest authoritative sources of information on it, neither can be trusted. The federal government doesn't understand it and doesn't under like doesn't understand everything that they're like touching with this and they don't necessarily understand what the consequences are going to be. And the other major source of information is the platforms and you can't trust them. They're not your friends. Mm -hmm. And so that's just it's it it's kind of overwhelming and like just kind of like crushing to sort of think about. And I just, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm not trying to burden you. I, I will say, you know, if it makes you feel better, if the online news act goes through Google might just remove, uh, access to my website <laughs> from the internet for Canadians. So, um, it, I, I agree with you. These bills are a mess. I'm wondering if they had just called it the big shiny tunes bill, it would have gotten a more across the aisle support as something because what we what we need is a digital version of big shiny tunes or much music and i i don't think we're we're getting that and the the platforms that used to be um required to provide that are effectively lying and saying you know if you regulate us we will be forced to punish you creators we don't want yeah. to have to to punish you but if we were to change the algorithm who knows what would happen Meanwhile, if you watch any video of one type on YouTube, yeah, you will get it, 12 I more mean, for the next two weeks, right? Like, Yeah, exactly. Like YouTube is overtly lying because about a bunch of what they're doing because they already do basically like geotagging and like, uh, you know, they'll straight up recommend like here are videos that are popular with other people in your neighborhood because we're like, we can see your IP address. Here's a music and video you so, should watch because the band is playing in your city next week and you can buy a ticket in the, the video. And you can buy a ticket in the, in the ads. You know, they already use a lot of like geolocation. They already, uh, they already have a lot of access to sophisticated algorithms where like, if, if the rule was just like, hey, you got to put your thumb on the scale a little bit. And if somebody is watching from inside Canada, like there needs to be uh, a there, there needs to be a thumb on the scale to to bias towards like Canadian based uh, uh, Canadian based channels really deep down inside the guts of the algorithm. Like that's already happening but it's not explicitly happening. It's just kind of happening organically as a result of like, uh, the fact that it's like, okay, you're in Canada watching certain kinds of, uh, uh, certain kinds of stuff. You're, you're watching it like in English, you're getting geo targeted ads. And so you're probably engaging with geo targeted ads. And since they're geo targeted ads that already biases towards like, canada related stuff and etc 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 but because it's not explicit like because my channel doesn't have you know does doesn't have that little maple grid down in uh, down in the corner um 
there is understandable uh reticence from like from legislators of like okay like is folding ideas can con we don't know because it's not apparent mm. and like and so people you know consumers like youtube is kind of like indirectly sort of feeding them can con kind of sort of just based off of the way that like systems interact but they have no way of like knowing that and you get the thing where like people you know i get it all the time where people are like oh i didn't know you were canadian until you mentioned like living in calgary mm. um and I don't know if there's a clean answer to that. Like, I do think that, like, I'm just going to kind of, like, stare wistfully at the uh, at the ceiling as I try to imagine, like, how do you balance these incentives? How do you balance the, the good parts of, like, what CanCon is and can accomplish in terms of protecting uh, local culture um, against just sort of the the flattening of what these global platforms sort of like represent. Uh, and there is, there's in that sort of this like critical question of, is it, is it strictly necessary? You know, can con arose when, uh, you know, media distribution was truly monolithic, you know, uh, there's only so many music video cable channels mm -hmm. and the answer was one. So yeah, maybe it, it's very reasonable to be like, Hey, you're the Canadian music video channel. Uh, you got to show some Canadian stuff. And in the early eighties, they were like, oh, that's kind of hard. 1997 they're like okay sure fine we could do like three straight hours of nothing but canadian programming um but there's also like that that development line in between those 1997's state of affairs was only enabled because the industry was forced to make canadian content like commercially viable yeah I, i'm not really sure like you and i think about it a lot what the particulars are because there are so many conversations around point systems whether it's whether it's film or music or others where the more granular you try to manage this just the more loopholes you create i think at a yeah. at a systems level i'm still just trying to argue for the value of understanding that there if not a canadian identity that there is actually canadian culture and, the, and that there are people like you producing things of, of value here and whether it was in a free millennial environment where we just don't want to be over inundated by the larger U S market, or now you are part of a, a global network and like we can lose ourselves more than we have to mm -hmm. all the things we've been talking about. I just, I just hope there's recourse for, for that to be highlighted and, and exist. I guess maybe to close this off, one of the ways that we can do that is for uh, our listeners, for our viewers, God, uh, who see this and came here because of beta kit and not because of folding ideas, what video would you recommend they check out to, to onboard themselves to the Dan Olson experience? Well, I'm really proud of our most recent, uh, our most recent one on Decentraland and the metaverse. I think it's one of the, one of the best things I've ever made. Uh, it was, uh, uh, a a difficult creative process in like the kind of the best way where like you you leave it you're exhausted you're angry uh you want to strangle everyone else that you that that you worked on it with and you're like but but very much sort of like a crucible yeah. kind of environment where it's like every every conflict made the final product like better thus big um folding ideas <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i think uh i think the one on decentraland and the metaverse i think it's very uh it's, it's very relevant to just sort of like internet culture and like inoculating yourself against hype uh and you know i i, I this kind of goes back a couple conversations but in terms of like what's sort of my like goal with this uh with all of this is um uh, by 
learning to sort of recognize these like recurring narratives because one of the big things that keeps coming up in these videos is that it's like hey like we've seen this before we, we know what sort of the like end goals of like this language is we know what this is uh, kind of all about is just learning to recognize like these these like hype narratives of tech driven solutionism mm -hmm uh that just sort of has that like ellipsis of like all right we make thing dot 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 the future and it's like what what if we applied the the uber model to t-shirts and fired t-shirts at you in a pneumatic tube literally a pitch i've seen and it's like no yeah that's not what what are you talking about i i agree that that video is is great i would honestly take a different tact with it i would say i would want everyone to watch your uh classic video where you review the american tale ps2 video game that's a pretty good one and um again because you're you just demonstrate commitment to suffering in so many different ways and then immediately follow that up with your Fortnite video your line goes up video and then let's let's go hustle culture uh, because not only will that connect the threads of we've seen this before, but I think, you know, we'll look back fondly on that uh, PS2 era of, of bargain bin uh, discs and, and again, have a certain amount of fondness for griffs yeah, that no longer... They it, it, it used to be that if you wanted to... <laughs> that if you wanted to... Do, where is it? Where is it? Uh, it it used to be that like if you wanted to do a certain kind of grift like you needed you needed to print CDs yeah. and physically ship them somewhere possibly for for a PAL system even um, for a, uh, yeah. the the fact that you have that sitting behind you is the, I may like uh, a, a icing on the cap of the highlight that this conversation has been um, Dan thank you so yeah. much for doing this man. Uh, every now and then when I do uh, when I do like a video podcast thing like from here people you know they try to read the stuff and what they sort of realize is that it's like this this shelf right here is very legit like this is just all like you know good to like reasonable <laughs> games but then like what the hell is going on on that upper shelf uh, that it's just like all movie tie-ins and just and it's like, and there's like no coherent order. It's like, what is a lot of fifty is, shades up there? What is the legend of Gahul? <laughs> uh, yeah, I I love garbage. I love trash. Trash enamors me. I love failed art. Um, and yeah. Well, uh, I eagerly await the next piece of failed art technology, dumb internet social system, or. Um, I don't know, Dow that was better left as a um Diablo Can a 2. Dow run a city? <laughs> the answer may shock you. Thank you so much, man. Super appreciate this. No problem. Thanks for having me.